Okay, we're back. All right, we're going to work on part two of uh, what, what I, we called it uh, Miracle or Wonder. And I've got my Bible up over here as well, so I'll be going back and forth. But um, just to bring us up to speed, we've been, well, let me start by reading these verses out of Romans uh, Romans 1, and it says in verse 19, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God himself has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, in some translations say from, in other words, by the evidence of the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature have been understood and observed by what he made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. Okay, so a pretty profound statement there, uh, pretty sweeping, I would say, where it says basically everything that you need and I need to know about God can be known through by examining, understanding what he made. So it was quite a masterpiece. Every artist, musician, sculptor tries to um, implant some of himself in, in what he's designed, making a statement. And so uh, God did the, the very same thing. And so I think that's a tremendous hot tip he dropped on us there that um, in the King James, I said I think it says even his Godhead and power or something like that. Uh, who understands all about the Godhead? And yet he's, he's, uh, he's implanted those understandings to the eye that has um, the smarts to see it. So... Um, based on that, we, we're we doing a little study here, um, kind of trying to get a hold of God's creation, maybe a little more understanding. I wouldn't come near pretending exhaustive understanding, but get a, a better understanding of it and find our, because it's, it's, it's going to speak to our own identities. Um, because we are, number one, part of that creation. Number two, we were actually, our forefathers were actually put in charge of caring for and serving, stewarding the creation, which would imply uh, a, another step of knowledge more than just being part of. There's this actual caring for. So uh, <clears throat> we just briefly we spoke that Genesis 1 and 2 is what we would call normal in God's term. And then starting with Genesis 3, we have a long stretch of abnormal in which we still find ourselves that does not end until the wedding feast. And actually what we call a new creation. So let us, lest we should err by thinking life is normal, it's not. And we can profit by at least getting a glimpse of God's definition of normal. We talked about we need to reclaim some vocabulary, and definitely the word normal is one. So uh, we, we're we going to look a, a, again at, at creation. We talked about the, the little thumbnail sketch that Nehemiah provided us there with the Jerusalem and clutter. And, you know, it was important that Nehemiah remove the clutter because he, he was not just redesigning. He, he was not a, a decorator coming in to do a whole makeover on God's city there. He was searching for the foundation lines. He was searching for the basic blueprint to rebuild on top of that. And that probably behooves us as well. We'll find out what God's basic ideas were and then rebuild on top of those things. So that having been said, we want to launch into uh, the importance today of, number one, of syncing up, getting in sync with his creation and me as a part of it and actually, and actually with that um, removed idea of being a steward as well. Then um, see what great thing it is that he, what great thing it is that through his creation he is moving towards. Because if we want to want to be up to speed with him, we've got to move with him. Um, and so, I, I, maybe I can't remember if we covered this or not, but you know, it's it's like um, <clears throat> the moving with creation is honoring God, and it's honoring His creation. Um, 
flaunting it is dishonoring him. Uh, we, and it's not, it's not as though God is the, the um, cosmic bean counter there and he's just constantly watching for the smallest error that he can bring reprisal upon or something. But it's more like a, a good three-point shooter in basketball. He respects gravity, he works with gravity, he counts on gravity. Um, we could say that he courts, play on words, gravity. Um, and, and, and sometimes there, there are people who try to thwart gravity. Actually, the devil was trying to get Jesus to thwart gravity, to dishonor gravity and having him throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple. And, and I've just seen this, that when we, we honor what's in place, it rewards us. When we dishonor, we get released into, I think, what God has designed to be relentless resistance. The creation has built into it a thing called relentless resistance. Uh, gravity does not take Friday and Saturday off. And so, no, it's relentless in its, its expression of itself, it is relentless. And if you resist it, you will meet relentless resistance. And really, I think this is the, the care and the mercy of God, even that, um, because it's all, a, it's all, a, it's all, all that resistance is like one big signpost of God that says, wrong way. You know, like you just turned, you just uh, turned exiting on the entrance ramp wrong way and that's not there to punish you it's not there to criticize you it's there to save you so uh, i don't well anyway that being said so we want to come into sync with what god has uh, is doing and as we do that we're going to i think we'll begin to see the glory of the thing that he's doing uh, something about that second cup of coffee so um we're, go we're going to, let me look up here. We're going to read a, uh, a portion of scripture from uh, Matthew, and it's Matthew 22. And this is a, whoa, what did I do there? Oh, no. Sorry about that. And, and this is a, uh, a, a parable that uh, we all know. Well, I just, I just had a little biblical problem here. Okay, well, I'll just tell you the parable. You know it, anyway. And it, it, it's the parable of the um, the man and the, uh, the the king who plans a wedding feast for his son. It's in Matthew twenty-two. You can read along there. And and the um, you know the imagine the. Of course, we have a rough time with um, royal rule and monarchical rule. We don't really have a concept of what that kind of, what life under that would be like. And so, but to these people, it's a very real thing. And when the king, being the most important man in the country, and maybe the most important man in your whole life, for your whole lifetime, rather, let me say it like that. Uh, because if you were born more or less at the time, that the prince, the young prince took control, it's very conceivable that he would be the Number one man, the whole time that you lived on earth, he would be the, uh, the definition of power and authority the whole time of your life. And so uh, extreme importance. And to kind of diss that importance was no small thing. So the, the king is, uh, is putting on a, probably what we, we could consider a great historical happening in that he's uh, plant, he's doing the wedding of the prince, his son, who will be the next ruler after him. So this was extremely significant, extremely important, a weighty matter. Uh, probably the, in, in a, a lifetime of an average citizen of that country, this it very possibly could have been the most important event to have happened in their life. And so it's kind of shocking as we read through the story and he's getting all the preparations made. You can sense the momentum. You can sense the, the, the uh, passion of the king and the, uh, the anticipation of the, this great event. 
and the RSVP start coming back, sorry, can't be there, got to be at the office that day. Or um, I think I have a cow who's going to give birth, so I need to be on the farm. And just the most mundane daily kind of excuses, which in comparison to the, 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 the grandness of the event happening, they didn't hold water and the king knew it. And so the, there was a certain royal fury that came by and, um, and Matthew had actually tells us this turned into a, a war and uh, a lot of blood was spilled. And um, ju just think of the, um, really the, the selfishness and the, the small, the myopic kind of hearts that these people must have had to, to not even be able to see that, hey, this decision I'm making is not just going to affect me, it's going to affect my children, my grandchildren, because the, the one who's getting married today, he is the future king, and uh, my ability to relate to him is important. But that did not seem to enter the picture. Now, that, that whole parable, um, it's pretty hard not to see that it is a, a picture of the... Um, the the uh, Jewish state at that time and, and what was going on, the, the first people to have received God's invitation and basically turned him down and the destruction that came because of it in 70 AD. And um, it wasn't against a people as, as much, I think, as it was against a system. And But people made up and supported the system, so... Uh, but not to be frustrated, of course, the, in the parable, the king, said, uh, this uh, all, something that all of us could get down now and have 10 minutes of thanksgiving, uh, the king sent forth his servants to gather in the whosoevers. And uh, probably, uh, I know all of my friends and all the people probably that ever listen or watch this thing are parts of the whosoever club, because we got in because of the the uh, the thick-headedness of those who refused, the doors swung open to you and I, the Gentiles. And we got into the wedding feast. That's wonderful. And so um, we could stop right now and have communion on that one. <clears throat> so uh, the, it, it's a real historical parable in that it's, it's, it's so obvious what he was prophetic because Jesus was telling what was going to happen, basically. It's really cool. Uh, but it doesn't end there either. The parable does not end there. There's another little disturbing part that finishes the thing off, and it, and it has to do with the wedding guests who did not have on the wedding garment. In other words, he did not put himself in sync with the grandeur of the event that was taking place. He was out of touch with the environment in which he was moving. So I think that's interesting to us, especially in light of this thing we're looking at here, that I believe there's a picture there that unless there is a sensitivity and a yieldness to the, uh, the context and the, the, the time frame uh, in which we find ourselves, and unless we have an awareness of my part and my responsibilities in the same, it can go poorly for us. And basically it would go just as bad for us as for those who decided to watch a, cow, a calf getting born instead of going to the king's son's wedding. So um, the man is found to not have had a garment and the king is, um, king is uh, says friend. <laughs> and they have him thrown out. And, and uh, of course, uh, you can read most of the commentators, and, and they will tell you um, that uh, it was very customary in those times for a king to supply wedding garments. People came from afar. There was not a laundromat at the corner. Um, th there was a number of reasons, but it, it, there was usually the provision was made. So, excuse me, I have a text here. Just need to check. Okay. So if uh, you didn't take advantage of the provision, then, then you know there wasn't even the, the ability to hold on to an excuse of well, I did, my clothes were at the, the dryers and I just, you know at the the cleaners and I didn't have a chance to pick them up. And, no, that's that's gone. There, it was just it was just pure and simple. Um, 
not respecting the 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 import of the moment of the event a failure to do so and so the result of that was not good <laughs> so it's kind of a key to us I think that we need to be keyed in to our time and what's taking place in front of our eyes and and where we fit in and and what falls to us in the way of responsibilities um, what falls to us in the way of proper conduct and and honoring and so that that's going to from there we're going to jump over to Psalm 19 um, and, and Psalm Psalm 19 I, I just uh, I did, in my notes I just called it the great plan which is and it's a wedding of sorts in itself makes the definite reference to that um, you know, I really need to get this Bible program back up here. So we're, uh, just give me a moment here, and and we'll see if we can't do that. I'm not sure what happened. Okay, there we go. All right, so uh, I said Psalm 19. Let's run down here. And so here, here's how Psalm 19 reads. It says, to the director of Davidic Psalm, uh, the heavens are declaring the glory of God, and their expanse shows the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their message goes out into all the world, and their words to the ends of the earth. He has set up a tent for the sun in the heavens, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, or like a champion who rejoices at the beginning of a race. Its circuit is from one end of the sky to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. Okay, so uh, he, he tells us there, he's definitely making a reference to the creation, and he's hinting, not hinting, he's just telling us directly how this is a, uh, a picture that we are to get. And uh, David was obviously being tremendously inspired prophetically and in a revelatory way here to, to write this. Just incredible, the revelation. But um, he had this experience. He saw that the whole, the picture of a, a day dawning was so dramatic because it showed forth the great plan of the ages. And it, 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 he basically says, so the skies the heavens, the creation. It's like a big tent that God set up for a wedding. And they would literally do that in those days. They had the bridegroom's tent and the bride's tent. And he's saying the heavens, the creation, are the bridegroom's tent. And it's set up and it's ready so he can burst forth unto that, that great wedding. So once again, we're talking about a wedding here. And so it, it behooves us to know how we fit in and, and how we should behave ourselves. We should behave ourselves. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, the picture is given to us there. And um, it, it's interesting because in some versions, it gives this idea that the day is, you know, the, the, the beauty of creation is speaking forth and, um, line upon line and you know we should just be but really what it's saying here is it is speak creation is speaking but nobody's hearing it nobody's hearing it says their line goes out and nobody's getting it nobody's hearing it and the word that it is such an interesting word that it used there for the line their line has gone is um, it's it's a word that all means like a tone a musical tone and it's, it's a tone, and, and the way it's set up, it would be like uh, if you go to, to the symphony, you, usually you'll see this kind of a thing happen where uh, when the thing's really ready to get rolling, the first violinist comes out and sits down, pulls out his bow and his instrument, and runs that bow across A, the note A. And that's an A440. And, and, and of course, what follows then is so important because he is setting the tone. And everybody else in that symphony has to get in sync with that tone. For the symphony to come 
off correctly for it to be the uh, the the uh, the work of beauty that it is, it must all be in tune with that A. And so what? It, and what? That's the same language that was being used here, and it's saying that the creation sends forth this note with the hope that the created will tune themselves up, get in tune, get in sync, get in line with that tune so that you're not out of tune. What happened to the guy who had no garment on, no, no wedding garment on? Out of tune. He was out of tune. He had, he had to get out. Can't have him in the symphony. So it's a... Uh, I think it's just an incredible picture for us there of, um, of, of what's going on there. And it, it, uh, so it means you and I are actually in the midst of God's preparation for the wedding for his son. And we are surrounded with that prep every day. And, and I'm not talking about amber waves of grain and mountains and purple mountains majesty and all that, though that is part of it. But, you know, creation for you and I, it's not referring to just the, the, the grand wonders of the world and so on. It's referring to the, the, the bit of it that goes by your face and my face every day. That is creation. Right now, creation here in my house and Mac Airbook and doing, that, that is the creation I am confronted with. That's what will speak to me. I don't have to go stare at the mountains or go out on the deep seas to, to hear a word from God. It's, it's running in front of my face if I have a heart and ears to see and hear. This is the beauty of the thing. It, it functions on the grand level. It functions in the micro, micron level. And its word is true. And so my, it, it, it falls to me to put myself in tune with that great thing that God is doing. Um, <clears throat> it says, you know, there, I, this is just kind of a side note, but I, I think it's really cool where it says, uh, his circuit is from one end of the sky to the other and nothing is hidden from his heat. Uh, we, I, I love truth because uh, when I have truth, I have light. And when I have light, I trip less. I bumped into less things in the darkness. I have my knees make out better. But the, the sun, the sun, and in this case, Jesus, gives us more than just truth. That's the light. He also gives us heat. And I, I, I liken that unto um, heart and head. And we, we, uh, most of us who've been around for a while, we, we find ourselves always. Um, candidates for adjustment between uh, the authority given head and the authority given heart and balancing those two and um, I never want my head to dominate my heart just don't and yet I like to say I'm not I don't want to send my heart out on in the dark for a walk alone they were meant to be together head and heart it's the um, innocent as and wise as scenario of doves and serpents. We need them both. We need our, our intellect inspired by the Holy Spirit. and We need our hearts that are soft and tender and feel the heat of the closeness of Jesus. Got to have that. Neither of the two by themselves make for a great scene. Okay, um, but it is interesting that heat can actually go places that light can't. You can have darkness, but you can still have heat. Um, I was just thinking, it's, uh, sometimes if you're the truth bearer, um, you, you have to rain on people's parades. And um, that's not a not a fun experience. And um, generally speaking, it's better not to rain on people's parades. It's better just to get a shovel and follow the horses and do your part. You have both parts there, and it's important. Okay. Um, and then later in that in that psalm, it 
it makes this funny shift and it, um, he's just he's just shown this great plan that uh, he is unfolding that his creation is portraying that the whole thing is about a wedding it's about a wedding the appearing of Jesus Christ is about a wedding it's a love story and you lose sight of that and you, you may end up with a lot of a lot of head and very little heart but he suddenly jumps and he begins talking aloud in the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is this, the word of the Lord is that. It's more than this, it's more than pure than honey, it's sweeter than honey, it's better. Than... And I think that's just kind of a resume of what this bridegroom brings to the marriage. All the benefits that, that he will bring to it. Um, okay, so uh, we can see that his, uh, this, this creation is not just some neutral, non-moving, inanimate thing that it's just nice to be here, but it doesn't respond to it. No, it is, it is pulsing with a direction and a purpose. It's out here to provide that context where this glorious thing can happen. And as we line ourselves up with it, we are lining ourselves up with God's purpose, and that creates this special thing called blessing. Uh, if we resist, ignore, dishonor that purpose, that direction, that drive of creation, it sets up a thing called cursing. In other words, bad stuff. We don't like how it turns out. And you can read, if you need stark examples of that, you can look in, in Deuteronomy 28 and so on, and, and it, has, it has it laid out pretty clearly there how that works out for you. So um, creation is not this neutral thing. It has a momentum. It has an impulse and that rewards those who align with it and it punishes, in quotes, those who don't. But, but it's not a personal thing. I, how many times have you seen the line in, in the dramas where the assassin has, has his, his prey at gunpoint and maybe they've even known each other before and he says to the one he's getting ready to execute, you realize this isn't personal, right? This is just business. Well, in a sense, that's the, the, the creation. When we meet this resistance and this cursing, this punishment for not honoring it, it's not personal. It's just the resistance that's there. It's business. It's how it's set up. Um, any farmer understands that. He, he, there is a time to plant your seed. Why is there a time? There is a time to plant your seed that is correct because... Creation, you are planting it in harmony with creation's um, cycle. And as you do that, creation rewards you. If you just decide, I want to plant any time I feel like it, regardless of creation, you will probably suffer. More than likely, you will not get a crop. And it wasn't because creation had a vendetta. Okay. So, um, the, the need to be able to honor and first discern and then honor that purpose is huge. It's huge. So that, 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 that puts us in an interesting situation, and it's going to lead us in what, to what we're going to focus on next time. And it, um, it, it has to do with this whole sense, and here's where we've been heading with all of this, this whole sense of blessing. What is the blessed life? Um, how does it differ from the other kinds of life we can live? How do we, how do we enter into that blessed life? How do we, uh, and I'll, and I will tell you, it's, it's not a one shot deal. It's not just sign here on the line. Um, I'm going in a little bit to what we'll cover next time, but it has to do with a thousand decisions daily decisions, small and great. Um, when we, I tune up an instrument, it's, I, you know, I'm going this way a little bit, that way a little bit. It's this constant calibration back and forth until I hit the right place. And then I have to come back and check it again. If uh, we play something particularly violent, uh, oftentimes you come back and check because you've put some stress and strain on the that tuning, and it, it requires a constant calibration, a constant watchfulness. 
And that's the kind of lives that uh, we get to live in Jesus. It's just this constant uh, correction. That may sound tedious. It's not. How tedious is it to you when you get in your car? And I don't know if you've noticed, but when you drive your car, it is, um, it's constant calibration. It's constant correction. Just your hand on the steering wheel never sits perfectly still. It's always moving. It's not moving great until you get to left hand, right hand turn or a U-turn. Then you want it to move pretty grandly. But up until then, it's just, it's just it's minute adjustments, minute adjustments. But the minute adjustments always to keep you in line with the plan and the direction that you're supposed to be going in. And so it is in our lives. It's a, it's a thousand decisions. But if we, if we develop the lifestyle of making those decisions correctly, what happens is this thing called blessing. Blessing is cumulative. Blessing is, it's the lifestyle we were cut out to live. It's the lifestyle that leads us back to normal. God's normal. Whew, that's a great thought. And so, um, if we oppose it, we're just embracing abnormality in all of its side effects. So we're gonna we're gonna head into that next time and examine, because as I said, this is where I believe for us Christians, we are to be living in blessing. That's our provision. Um, I was thinking. I was thinking earlier today. We sometimes you go to different countries. The um, the the current it, and the electric electricity in the houses are, are is different voltage than that. So um, and so you and not only that, but the receptacles are different. You've got to have a different. You've got to have an adapter for the voltage. You a lot and now a lot of appliances come built in adapter for the voltage, an adapter to be able to just plug in the wall because they have different size holes and different formations in that. So the provision can be right there for running your, your program, whatever you need to do, whatever electrical device you need to run. The provision is there. It's well able to do, well able, above and beyond what you have need of, but without hooking up right, without the adjusting yourself without adjusting your your approach that provision can go un, unused and I believe most of God's people are really struggling to find the right recept, receptacles and the right adapters and and we just don't get the power that sh could run our lives in such a nicer way. It's um, it's so close, and yet without the right hookup, without the understanding that I have to adjust to tap into that, it just sits there, and I sit here in the dark. So we'll we'll get into that next time. Thanks for watching this, and be blessed. <laughs>